I said to them, and they, they've got a management team that I want to make. Chris and Cindy have worked since day one along with them to rebuild this. And I said, I know it's going to be a busy weekend, but please come to the fest for Beatle fans. I said, it's your fans. There are a few thousand people who need to see you. Gentlemen, we're here for you. First question, has anybody slept? Not me. No. <laughs> Not very much. That's so exciting right. last night. Wonderful. 14,000 people at the Barclay Centre. Wow. Yes. And um, we went on quite near the end, and so we were sitting there for oh, no. oh, oh, three oh, hours. Oh, hours oh, waiting oh, for oh, so exciting. All these wonderful bands <laughs> playing. And, and then our moment came, and, and we really wanted to treasure it. Of course, the, the yeah, okay. adrenaline was really running through our veins oh, all night, and uh, so we haven't slept on that. <laughs> it's great to be here with you and to share this great excitement this afternoon. It was, it was kind of neat for me as a Brooklyn boy to have it at the Barclays. Had you played Brooklyn before in any of the Murray the K shows and that stuff? That was our very first show over here. We came over on Christmas Day, 1964, with the number one record in the nation. And we were playing uh, with Patti LaBelle, Benny King, the Drifters, the Shirelles, Jack Chuck Jackson. Jackson. Um, it was just, it, I mean, we were scared stiff because these guys were so talented. We were 18, 19 years old, you know. But they, they were fantastic to us. They took us to their hearts. And I remember particularly some wonderful sessions speaking uh, with all of us um, to Patti LaBelle after the shows each night. And she became a real friend. And she was, I remember her saying at that time, there's a new kid on the block. You've got to check her out. She's called Aretha Franklin. Oh. I remember that happened. A new kid on the block. And then she said, and another, another girl you've got to really look at is Nina Simone. We hadn't heard either of these names. Aretha hadn't even joined Atlantic. It was a cabaret period beforehand. But, you know, it, it, it's treasured memories, actually. <laughs> was, that always, was that your first trip to America for all of you? Yes, we only, it was six months after we signed the contract. Were you scared? Just a bit. <laughs> you see, the thing to remember is that America is the home of rock and roll. It's the home of the blues. And this is the music we absolutely loved. So all British musicians are desperate to get to America, to the home of rock and roll. And so all our dreams came true, but we were 18 and 19 years old, so it was quite a lot to take in. It was very, very exciting and incredibly scary. <laughs> what, what everybody has said to me, every band that first did this in the 60s all said, it's very big. America is bigger than we ever... Not only big, but it, it was. I mean, New York, when I first came to New York, uh, I didn't like it for the first, um, you know, couple of trips because it was just so overwhelming. And the difference between the culture in the UK and in America at that time was unbelievable. All the cars to us at that time looked like mobile jukeboxes, you know. <laughs> and, and, and it was so different to the, the UK you know, the UK situation culturally. So it was quite overwhelming at first, but then New York actually has become one of my favorite places in the world, I have to say. Awesome. Also, the, the main thing, when we first came here, was to hear sirens on the cars, because English police cars had bells. So we weren't used to that. <laughs> it, who was it? Uh, uh, oh, somebody, was, Neil Innes. We used to the Bonzo Dog Band, said we, we rented a map, we, we bought a map and we rented a car because we're going to drive to Canada and drive. He goes, and we just, we never noticed, we just thought we're kids that England would be the same size. Nobody ever said to us, you know, you could fit four UKs inside this country. We thought, well, we'll drive to Chicago, how long could that be? He goes, well, it must be like from London to Liverpool. It looks like it's that far. There was, um, I, I remember early on discovering there was a ranch in Texas called uh, King Ranch, and it's bigger than the U it's bigger than England. <laughs> One ranch, <laughs> uh, unbelievable. It, it's big. It's very big. How this all started, and it's something that that Colin and I were talking about before with Rod. They're playing. You, the band, the band has gone their separate ways. You created Archie. We've got these huge, beautiful hits of Hold Your Head Up and God Gave Rock and Roll to You. It's just really cool. 
And what year was it? Was it 2004? When did you sing together? When did you guys play? Well, it was, it was either when we got back together. Get back together. It was either 1999 or 2000. Still, well, I was 55, so it was 2000. Oh, yeah, I was 35, I remember. When you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. then we, we got back together again, and Rod was very. Rod's a very successful producer. You know, he was a he was a studio musician, and I had a keyboard player in my solo band who was who never turned up. He's one of those guys who he might turn up and he might not. It was getting very very difficult. So I said to Rod, "Is there any chance you could help me with the the rest of this tour?" And Rod said very kindly. I'll do the last, these last six dates, I'll do them, but I don't want to do any more than that. And that was 20 years ago. And so the six dates grew into 20 years. And that, that's how we got back together again. But we didn't actually get over to America. I think when you say 2004, that was probably... About, when I first saw you here. About the time when we, we came back to America for the first time, yeah. Six dates, and I won't do another one. Famous last words. Yeah, I've done, there's been another five since then, Colin, hasn't it? <laughs> no, no, it was crazy, and we've been touring really, really intensely. Uh, not, not so much with these two fantastic guys, the, the original guys. I think mean, that actually came about because Colin and I, first of all, got back together. Um, with, to, our, to my amazement, it was a complete buzz, and, and I really, really enjoyed it, so it just carried on and carried on. Um, Chris used to come and see, see us. We started to do more and more Zombies material because we realised there was a lot of stuff we'd never ever played live. Um, and then one day Chris said, do you know what, 2008 is coming up and that's the 40th anniversary of Odyssey and Oracle. He said, do you realise, because we broke up before Odyssey and Oracle actually came out, we've never played the, the album from start to finish. He said, what do you think about the idea of getting the surviving original guys back together again? And we started thinking about this, and we didn't know if it was going to be possible, but then we realised that when we recorded, um, and it had a lot to do with the Beatles as well, because we walked into Abbey Road just as they were walking out, having finished Sergeant Pepper, and they'd left all their... The two things that they, they gave to us, really, in that studio. First of all, because Brian Wilson had used an 8-track on Pet Sounds, um, Paul McCartney and John Lennon said, we've got to have an 8-track. And the guys at Abbey Road said, there is not an 8-track in this country. And John Lennon said, well, sort it out. We need, we need more tracks. So, and he just walked out the room, as he usually did, you know. So they scratched their head and they went to the ends of the earth to do this. And they found, they, they discovered methods of, of basically of providing more tracks um, uh, to record. Linking two machines together. So, what actually happened um, was that the other thing that John Lennon had left around in the studio and hadn't picked up yet was his Mellotron. And so, sorry John, but I didn't even ask him, but I just opened it up and there's Mellotron all over Odyssey and Oracle. But it means that when you do the stuff live, it's very important to have two different keyboard parts. So we started with the premise saying, listen, if we are going to do Odyssey and Oracle, we're going to reproduce every single note on the album. And that means, first of all, um, there was only one guy we could think of, Darian Sahanaja from the Brian Wilson band, knew he's a fantastic musician. And he knew my keyboard box better than I did. In fact, when we started rehearsing, he'd say, uh, Rod, I think you'll find you played this here. <laughs> That's like, an awkward conversation. No, not really. No. But, uh, <laughs> and I would say to him, no, no, Darian, that's not the harmony. He said, uh, can I just play you this? And, you know, so he was absolutely fantastic. And he played those seven keyboard parts. Chris, at the time, Chris and I, when we recorded Odyssey and Oracle, were sharing a flat and we, uh, we, we wrote it in the flat and we would talk to each other. And one of the things Chris had in the flat was uh, an 1890 something Victorian pump organ. And we did Butcher's Tale on that. And he'd long since lost that. Yes, he did. Um, so I sourced for 2008 another Victorian pump organ, you know, with sort of everything. With the, you know, you have to do this as you're, play, as you're playing it. 
Um, and, and we did. We reproduced every single note on, on the album. And it's occasion, that was supposed to be the only gig that we ever did at Odyssey. Yeah, also, right. Rod, I don't know if you remember, but when we were first talking about doing Odyssey and Oracle in its entirety with the surviving original members, Ron and I had been out playing live regularly. So we were, we were used to being out on the road and playing concerts. But Chris and Hugh hadn't been playing. I don't think Chris had picked up a bass guitar in 40 years. Since 1967, that's the last time he picked up a bass guitar. On stage. The truth, truth, is, truth is, actually, he had been playing, but in the smaller type of little uh, local dance bands and little rock bands that I was, I was playing in. So I wasn't too far matched. Absolutely. Basically. But I, I, I said to Rod, you know, before we commit to playing in a big venue, the whole of Odyssey and Oracle live, we really ought to get together with the other two and just see if they can still play it. Now, it might sound a bit rude, but I thought it, it was just being it's a fair question to it, it's, You know, so we got together one morning at Rod's, and these two guys had really done their homework, and they were absolutely note perfect. They were note perfect. And Rob and I, who had been out on the road regularly, playing to here, there and everywhere, we were bloody awful. <laughs> we had Complete disaster. We, we hadn't practiced at all. These guys were fantastic. Rod and I, we walked out with our tails between our legs because we, we, we just were making mistakes all over the place. So it was, it was very, very funny and, and we got our comeuppance, I'm afraid. But, but then we did practice a bit, didn't we? And that was supposed to be one night, and, and the place sold out immediately, um, and so it became three nights. And then before we went on stage for that first night of Odyssey and Oracle, our manager, we always tell people never to say who's in the audience, you know, because it can freak you out if a, if a real hero of yours is in the audience. But he just said, oh, there's uh, Robert Plant out there, there's Snow Patrol, um, there's Robin Hitchcock, I can't, I can't remember all the people that were there actually, and Paul Weller. And he said, and Paul Weller, he said, I've just been out and it's raining hard and he's waiting in line, you know, about three or four hundred yards away. And we said, oh, for God's sake, get him in. And he came in, he came to, it was three nights in the end, he came to all three concerts. And before we walked on stage that night, I thought, my God, I hope this is going to work. Because, <laughs> because if it doesn't, this is going to be the longest night of my life. You know, but we could tell within, really within a minute or two minutes that it's going to be great. And then, so after that, occasionally we put things together and particularly last year was the 50th um, anniversary of, of the recording of, of um, our, uh, or the release of, of Odyssey and of, of Odyssey Oracle. So we actually said, okay, this year we're going to concentrate on it. So Hugh and Chris came along with us and toured a lot with us over the last year. And it's been fantastic. The last tour we've done in America was in 1965. Um, and this felt like continuing that tour. Chris's jokes were exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there, no, there is a, the there's, a real, there's a real connection with Odyssey and Oracle and, and the Beatles, because as Rod's already said, the Beatles literally walked out the day before. they just finished Sgt. Pepper. They walked out the day before we went in to do Odyssey and Oracle. Sadly, we didn't meet them, but the tambourines and other percussion instruments were all over the floor. We were because we're big Beatles fans, and we Huge, were pick, yeah. we were picking up these percussion instruments off of the floor where they would left them. And of course, as Rod said, he was using John Lennon's uh, Mellotron, and we used the same engineers that they used, Jeff Emmerich, who's been here. here. Who's a very well known engineer. There's another one called Peter Vince who worked with the Beatles. And although we mostly use a different studio to them, we use Studio 3, which when you, if you go into Abbey Road, Studio 3 is the first studio on the left. Um, they, they did record in there, but mostly they recorded in Studio 2, which is further down the corridor, just in case you ever go there to record. It's further down and it's on the right, and then you go down these famous steps where they used to record.